introduce him as a fantasy author, um, but for reasons I think that will become apparent later on in the interview, I don't think he'd like to be called a fantasy author. So should we merely say multifaceted author illustrator? Just a fantasy. Just a fantasy. Possibly. A figment of my own imagination. This could be an interesting interview, folks. <laughs> um, we'll start off with the, with the questions that everybody asks um, of, of, of authors. We'll get, we'll get the dross out of the way first. Why fantasy? How do you get into writing? And um, why fantasy? Well, it beats wearing a mask and holding up post offices. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, no, I suppose if you want me to be sort of semi serious here. Uh, having written horses for a living for some time before I started writing, I was in the saddle eight hours a day exercising the horses when I wasn't actually at the shows, you know, beating them to death. And while you're sort of sitting there in the saddle, you've got to think of something because, you know, your backside's numb and, you know, you've got a long time there and you're cold. And so you make things up about the countryside you're riding through. It's early in the morning, you're looking down, there's a village below you with little lights. It's a night beast camp, you know, if you're doing the fast work, you're galloping for the king. So that's how the road to uh, Underfall really began, as sort of exercising the horses. And, you know, it just developed, and eight hours a day is a lot of time to think about something like that. And I made up stories for the kids, and when I got the sack, it just grew into that first story. <laughs> Because Sheila said, why don't you write that book you've been boring us with when we're out riding? And that was the road to Underfall. It took a year to do it, just over a year for the first one. I hadn't thought about getting it published. Um, Harper Collins bought it within two weeks of me finishing it. Uh, it was a one in 33,000 chance of that happening without an agent or anything. I just walked in the front door, threw it on the desk, and the rest is history. The later books that you've written. Um, You've illustrated yourself. Um, why no illustrations in Underfall, the first one? Um, they just wanted the, the manuscript. They weren't interested. There were 70 pictures done for the first one. I did them as I wrote the book. Uh, but they just weren't interested. They've now since produced them as postcards, T-shirts, limited editions. And I've made them pay dearly for that. I told them they would be sorry. And now they pay me to do 10 for each book. But they didn't want them for the first one. They said that they didn't in, um, have fantasy and you know, illustrations to get that they said it wasn't kosher. Then, but you know, they've changed their mind a lot since. They also paid me virtually peanuts for the first book. I mean, you know, sort of take, take the money and run. You didn't. When you followed up the Alundium trilogy, um, you wrote the two books, The Despite Paul. And, and, and its sequel, which were totally different in character to Alundium. Alundium is, is classic high fantasy. Suddenly it changed and became a lot darker. How did that come about? Well, I think um, the Alundium trilogy rather brushes the surface <coughs> of the people in the story. I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a great story. I certainly wouldn't write it the same way now. I'd want to write more about the people in it rather than just, if you like, the scenic overview. Um, I think the animals are more important in the road to Anvil than the people. And in Glitter Spike, all the people and their social economic positions within the world I've created became more important. And how they redressed everyday living. Um, and I mean, that in itself made it a darker story. It made it, a, I think, a more real story. But I don't think people necessarily want reality. I don't know. I mean, it's a confusing thing. People want to buy more of this so-called high fantasy where they can escape into a world where nothing's really threatening. Um, they seem a little scared of things that do threaten them. Um, we talked about how animals were important in Underfall. They, they actually, in the road to Alundium, are crucial, aren't they? I mean, they, they play a more pivotal part than, than a lot of the people. You have a feeling that without the animals, the forces of light would never have won. How important are animals to you in your life? Um, I think they're a big part of it. We've still got horses at home. Well, my wife's still got one. We've got an old pony. We've got a dog, a cat. So I've just written, I'm writing about the dog in next year's book. He has a major part, and he's 
been hanging around my desk for months. You know, he now will not go anywhere else if I'm writing, in case I'm writing about him. <laughs> he no longer comes when I call him when we're walking. You know, spends a lot of time trying to reproduce himself with other dogs. So, you know, carries a breed on. Um, I think animals are important to me. I think they were more important with Road to Underfall because I was working with the horses and the war horses. I mean, I was always looking for a horse like um, the question of what was the name of the horse? The question it was. I always forget the gun It's a long time ago now. Um, I was always looking for a horse like that to ride in competitions because I couldn't have failed to bring the prizes home to my sponsors. And you know, you only you earned your living by winning. And if you didn't win, they gave you hell. And you know, if you didn't come anything worse than third, they wanted to shoot it and have breakfast and buy you another one. Um, so you're always looking for this horse that you know would get up every morning and just win. And I think the question just was that horse, mm. you know, nice and nasty at the same time. Mm. Your, your dog is featured already, though, hasn't he? Yes, yeah, on the front of the watch your back. Yeah, that's right. The yeah. dog is down Where there. Is he? Down the dog there. creeps into everything. Yeah, he's a he's a really nice dog. I ran him over. Going to a fire call because I do volunteer firefighters <coughs> in my village. There's 13 of us. You know, we keep Norfolk safe. Um, well, there are other people argue about this because we'd like to see a good fire. You know, keep <coughs> going until they bring the food. Um, and I was going to a fire call and he ran under our. We had a jeep there, a big heavy Daihatsu, and I sort of just smashed his leg into smithereens and went over his head. His head's fine. It wasn't even a mark on his head. Well, it scratches, but no, nothing broken. But I dashed off to the fire and she took the dog to the vet. And when I got back six hours later from the fire, there was this dog with a complete metal leg and a 600 pound bill. You know, and I'm still going to fires <coughs> to pay for that leg. But the dog does not hold it against me. Yeah. So when, when it gets written into the next one, it's going to have the metal leg as well? No, he doesn't have the leg. He's just a total hero. He has to be. But he's as useless as my dog. You know, I mean, he sleeps a lot, farts a lot. You know, does the sort of things that a real hero dog would do. <coughs> his father didn't in the book. His father was was much more of a sort of hero dog, hero hero dog, but the son was. Um, you don't write children's high fantasy anymore. You you changed entirely um, with the book Shadow in the Watchgate yeah. to to a modern setting. I felt that fantasy, I mean high fantasy is great and creating the world is fun and it's nice to sort of to meander through a, a world you create and I mean you have to be fairly thorough when you create a world. You've got to really redress the eccentricities of the technology but I think it's far more of a challenge to write something in the world that we actually live in where you can go out and check it out. Um, you know I find to make to make a fantasy in today much more of a challenge for the people in it, for the, for the technology. You know, you really can actually reach out and touch these things and, and it's got to be as right as you can get. So how important is research to you? Well, it's great fun. Uh, research is fun. It's important that whatever you write about works. I mean, if you read a Wilbur Smith book and he's taking off in an aeroplane, you get the feeling that he's either been in the cockpit or we certainly read the manual and uh, you know it's important to do that and I felt with Shadows in the Watchgate was the first time I had to research things that people could say no you've got this wrong and the heroine has a Lotus Turbo Esprit so we had one out for the afternoon from Lotus. I mean that's the advantage of your publishers they bring them up and write this really nice letter with the, with the heading and everything and you turn up to Lotus and they just give you this brand new car and they say bring it back by five o'clock. And uh, <laughs> I've never been so frightened in my life. <laughs> I wanted to buy it and Sheila said I was not to buy the car. Because I mean it killed us two or three times a car today. Christ was that quick. Um, for the same book I had a, I wanted my, I needed to get my hero in the end of the book from sort of, well, I suppose, ten, 20 miles from Norwich into the centre of Norwich very, <coughs> excuse me, very quickly. He was riding a horse and he could never have got there by daylight, you know, chronologically in the book, so we needed to do it quicker. So I thought I'd fly him there and we resurrected this, this um, old B-17 bomber. So I had, a, after nine months of negotiations 
of the Sally B Foundation of Ducks, but they gave me a ride on the Sally B, which they used as the Memphis Bell in the film. That if you, any of you saw the Memphis Bell film, well, it's the same aeroplane, but it's, it's still paint, it's got a painting of the Memphis Bell on one side. That's how it was left. They did agree that they would repaint the whole aircraft afterwards back to Sally B's colours, including its symbol on the front, its nose cone art. But in fact, it's now Sally B one side and Memphis Bell the other. You know, they've left it like that. But that was a great piece of research, and I've never been so frightened as taking off in this antique, you know, at Duxford, because um, there's no seats behind the pilots, the navigator's chair's gone, and it's just a desk, and they said, well, if you want to really, really find out what it's like to fly this thing, just stand behind us and hold on to the seats, and I'm trying to write notes, you know, and they're starting to wind the engines up one by one, and my pen's going like this, and then it's sort of, you know, we crept around the taxiway onto the runway and then they said well you better hold on tight because we're going up onto full power now and I just went sort of backwards down the cockpit <laughs> my hand just came off the backs of the seats and you know I had to sort of struggle back up there and we got to I think about 140 miles an hour and I said when does it take off and the pilot said any time now <laughs> <laughs> and, and he was I mean these these two guys who'd flown in the war and they'd flown these planes. And he said, but in the war, with a full bomb load, we wouldn't take off to way down there by the, <coughs> by the boundary fence. Yeah, and then suddenly we were up round, and I was down and getting out, and it was all over. But research, I find modern research great fun, because you do have to have things right for the reader. 90% of what I took in notes that day were totally unusable, because even I fell asleep reading through them, because it's you know irrelevant technical stuff. But it does give you something to get the essence of what it feels like to fly one of those things, or what you need to do. Uh, you know, it's, I suppose really the secret of, of taking the research and using it is picking out the things that are really pertinent to the story and putting them in. I mean, the thing I actually liked about it was they're flicking all these switches and dials and gauges and making all these very technical sort of sounding things. I mean, they obviously knew totally what they were doing. The, one, the two things that really struck me were both of them put on these silk gloves before they started. I didn't realise they were just on the cockpit, and they both put on these silk white gloves. And then the engineer came out in front and, um, and sort of put his thumbs up, and they started splitting everything. And then the, one of the propellers started to turn slowly, and the co-pilot was counting one, two, three, four, five, six fire, because what they do is pump the fuel into the carburettors, one after the other. And they call it counting six blades, but they do it for every engine, because as each engine goes, so the sequence gets faster, because you want to get the whole thing running. You know, and that really was the thing about taking off, was getting the sequence right and firing the engine at the right moment, because if you don't, you've got to start all over again and pump them all full. But, you know, it's trying to pick something like that out of all the detail and using that as... Yeah. As you're, you're thinking in your book. I did find in that particular sequence that it was far too complicated for them to commandeer this antique bomber and just fly it away. It would have been too... There was just something wrong with that. And I drove away from Duxford. I'd promised the Sally B Foundation a credit in the front of the book. <coughs> they had to have that because I'd had the day, you know, the afternoon with them. So I had to use the plane. If I hadn't had to give them the credit, I wouldn't have used the plane. I felt the sequence was too complicated for the book. And all the way home, I was thinking, how the hell can I use this plane without going into all this technical jargon that's needed to get this bloody thing off the ground? You know, I mean, even down to sort of pulling the wheel chops away and everything. It's, you know, it's just too much there. And just about, about a mile from home, I suddenly realised the whole book is about magic. And the magic is very evil in the book. But there's also an element of good to this magic. So what we do in the book is we resurrect the plane with the magic. The plane is not there as, a, as an antique that's been loved and cared for for 50 years. It's been lying on the edge of this disused bomb station as a rotten, rusting hulk for 50 years. And when the, the two people ride up to it and they use the magic, the magic resurrects this thing back into what it was at the moment it crashed and the hatch underneath opens. And this dead pilot, the ghost of this pilot, he looks down and says, hey, buddy, do you want to go somewhere? You called me out from eternity to go somewhere. So when they're sitting in the cockpit and they're firing the engines, he may count six blades, but all the remaining dials that aren't smashed and have been 
sort of chewed to pieces by the bullets as they were you know, being hit, they are all reading off the gauges, you know, because the engines were all on fire when it crashed. And I felt that was a much better way of using it. And it cut all the technical stuff out, as long as I knew what the engine temperature, cylinder head pressures were, <coughs> you know, which I knew anyway because I'd asked. Um, you know, you have to do that. There was a lot of... Um, Am I talking too much? No, 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 you just, you just carry on, you didn't do it well. You had to do a lot of military research for that book as well, because part of the magic was the resurrection of, of, of a bunch of stuffed dummies in military uniforms in a, in a museum. Yes, How hard right. was that to do? Uh, well, I wrote for a, 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 um, a regiment called the Legion of Frontiersmen, um, during my horse riding days. It's a South African regiment. I wasn't particularly interested in the, the politics and apartheid in South Africa. I mean, I felt very embarrassed about joining because of that, but I loved the uniform, and I thought that looked really smart. Um, and, of course, I was riding anyway, so, you know, it was a great thing to do, and I just looked really beautiful in that stuff, and charging about with a lance, and learning to tent peg, and, you know, learning to shoot people from horseback. You know, it was just brilliant. And it did involve learning a lot about military history, and I feel one of the things when you write about is traditional fantasy is the techno if you're using a horse orientated technology, you know, I mean, uh, as opposed to a you know, sort of a modern technology, you've got to know how far a horse will travel in a day. You've got to know uh, what sort of stuff they carried, um, you know, how they bivouacked, um, you know, feeding procedures. Even if you don't use it, you should know it. And this is where a lot of traditional fantasy falls down: is they gallop a hundred miles. You know, which is sort of, in a sense, something that's totally impossible. And I think, you know, readers get very disappointed when things don't hang together. But for that particular book, I know a fair amount about the Crimean period, so mm. it was fairly easy. And the scout, I have a uh, painting of him on my wall at home. So, you know, he's somebody I know very much a lot. Yeah. Why, why did you give up that? It sounds like a, a great career. Uh, well, I'm dyslexic, and, you know, left and right when you're wielding a sword is really quite important. And horses with clipped, there are still, well I suppose they're probably all dead now, but there were a few horses with clipped ears where I'd, you know, taken a little off. But, uh, yeah. I was asked to resign my commission. Yes. <laughs> the body count was just getting higher. <laughs> People were having to duck. Shadows were set in um, Norwich. I've never been to Norwich, but I felt after I'd read the book that I might as well have been. Um, it felt very real. Are you, are you very, very familiar with that area? It's about 30 miles from where we live, um, which is a 35 minute journey. There's not a lot of traffic in Norfolk, so you can get 60 miles an hour. It's quite acceptable. The police don't like it. But I've spent a lot of time in the city. It, it is a, it's a university city, it's a medieval town. It has an enormously attractive sort of old section which I think I've fairly faithfully resurrected Shadows of the Watch Gate. I do, I do move it around a bit. I mean, the Castle Narrows, in fact, do not exist. They're in Kingsley. And the door in the picture is from Thornsby College in Kingsley, and the twisted pillars come from Clifton House, which are next to it. So I move them to Norwich. But I think fantasy does give you a certain amount of artistic license you know, to, to uh, move things around. Was there anything else that you took from there? What, from Kingsley or from? From, from Norwich. Well, I was thinking about the taxidermist shop. Oh, yes, well, that, that, that's real. It does exist, and there's a procession of Americans. Americans are really good at this. Um, you know, if they like something in a book, they will chase it down, and they, they troop into this shop during the summer, and he really hates me because they just come in armed with the American edition. They don't buy anything, but they just want to look at the animals and, oh, this is where it really happened. Yeah, uh, he doesn't. He's not too keen on that. And they do find it, even though I didn't use the name of his court. Mm -hmm. There is only one taxidermist in that part of the town. He has a an eagle owl, uh, I mean a live eagle owl, which perches behind him where he works, and you can see it from the shop, you know, working at his bench, sorting his animals' carcasses out, and you know, sort of restuffing them and whatnot. And I was watching him. It was after I finished the story, and I just happened to look at the owl behind him, and he turned his head and looked at me, and I said, Christ, it's all true. <laughs> 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 I began to sort of edge backwards towards the door, the, the, the few clocks that I mentioned in the story, they're ticking away at the door, and I thought, you know, 
there's a hand going to reach out and grab my shoulder. I'm going to look around, and that bear in the corner is just going to sort of have me. And he looked up and he said, no, it's real. Didn't you realise it's real? And I said, no, 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 absolutely no idea. I do go in there, but uh, I was still a bit embarrassed because I'd never bought anything in there either. I had no stuffed animals in my house at all. I'm going to have the dog stuffed when he's uh, <laughs> then put on wheels and a little motor so he can still run around the room barking. <laughs> The um the hero in, in Shadows is a, is a fireman. Yes. Not you. No, no, it's, it, he is um, Dennis Winner, lives in my village, uh, bachelor. He's the sort of guy, if you're in a tight spot, he will always rescue you. Um, he's just an absolute hero. I mean, a really nice, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you break down and ring him at three in the morning, he would just come out and automatically mend your car or mm -hmm. tow you home. Or, uh, I've been in some tight spots in fires with him. And, you know, he's always rescued me. He does wear the glasses. He did have them tied around his head with a rubber band at one time. Um, and he did do something. Um, he went scar slope skiing, and we, they did joke and call him Downhill Deck. And DEC are his initials, which is why he was always called Deck. Uh, you know. Yeah, he's real. Yeah. A, bit, a nice, I don't know, not an unheroic hero, but he's a hero down to a real person here. Yeah, a very honest, self-facing, nice, ordinary guy who, um, and it hasn't, fame has not gone to his head. <laughs> you know, nobody buys him drinks anymore. But, uh, uh, he's, uh, he, he, he is okay, and it is him. And Geordie, the fireman in the, in the museum when it's burning down, he is very real, and he and I were trapped in a building on the Kingsley Dock fire and the building was collapsing around us and we couldn't get out. And the only way they could save us was to hose us with water because it was so hot and the building was spontaneously igniting and the roof was melting on us. And it was coming down and uh, the fiberglass was melting over the helmets and coming down. And Geordie was behind me and I was holding the branch or the hose and he was backing me up. And he said, I don't want a George Medal. I just want to live and get out of here, which I put in the mm. book. I mean, that's true. And I thought we were neither of us going to get out of there. Uh, I mean, we, luckily, they got us out. But for a few moments there, I really felt I was staring into eternity. Mm. You know, it was as hot as hell. I thought, this is it, I'm going to hell. You know, no way out. And that, of course, all got put in the book. Yes, that's right. And I was very, was very frightening. That. Well, fire yeah. is really frightening. You know, it's, mm. it's, uh, it's a very, very powerful force if you get trapped in it. Um, my first time in a, a burning house, we were looking, we were told there were <coughs> a couple of people in there and uh, there was a baby in there. In fact, actually, there wasn't anybody in there. They'd all managed to get out, but we didn't know. And they, the uh, officer in charge sent me upstairs. We'd run out of oxygen facilities and we were still looking. And he said, I want you to crawl along the floor and search for this baby. And I was searching, keeping low on the floor with a rag around my mouth. And I felt the shape of this body on the bed, and I thought, oh, God, I found it, and it was a child. And I started pulling it towards me, and I realized it was a dog. I mean, you know, I was so relieved to find that that wasn't a um, little baby. You know, you never know what, we never know what we're going to when the alarm goes, because we're all volunteers, we're all sitting at home doing our, you know, working on our own things, and then suddenly, you know, this thing we wear bleeps, and you're off. We dash out. We really run in two minutes. Two minutes from when that goes, we're on the road. It was quite a departure, uh, this book. How did you publishers take that? Shadows in the Watchgate, they were very opposed to it because they wanted more high fantasy and you know, more of the traditional stuff. And I wanted to do Watchgate. I'd handed them a 20 page synopsis and it worked out to a 60 page synopsis in the end before they were satisfied that they let me. They pay me to write it. Um, I think in some ways it's been my most successful book, and in other ways it hasn't. I mean, people have preferred the work in that book, but it hasn't, it's never sold as well as the first book. Um, but it still continues to sell, so maybe, I mean, it's got a, it's got a few years to catch up yet, so I mean, who knows? And it's, you know, it's gaining in popularity. I think people like it more, they like that. That's the stuff I do better. Seems to be from what people say. So, what Even. came after that? 
Well, I did hit Nekos after that, which I tried to, to, to mix uh, a high fantasy and a modern fantasy together. I think it's a great story, but I, I think I tried to encompass too much into it. It's too broad a landscape. Uh, I mean, it works as a story, but I, I either prefer that one or, um, or Stone Angels, the, the, one, the last one, this year's book. Yeah, which has gone back to sort of more watch case type stuff, mm. but very different. So how did that one come about? Um, well, that's not, it's, it's set in Norwich Cathedral. It's another Norwich story. Um, we always take all our American friends to see the castle and to see the cathedral, you know, we, sh we show them the, the, the old part of the town. And we were in the cathedral, we'd taken a, a sculpt, American sculptor friend to see it, and he was loving all the sort of, you know, church architecture. And this really wild looking guy suddenly sort of started pestering us. He was he was dressed in a sort of suit, but it was shabby without being he wasn't a derelict, he was more like an eccentric student, you know, but slightly older than that. Hair was sort of very wild and, and sort of you know, sort of sticking up. And he just kept pursuing mostly Sheila and trying to thrust this bunch of papers and stuff at her and just kept getting in our way. And he was making an awful lot of noise in the cathedral, but nobody seemed to be noticing it, just us. And all three of us saw him. Well, eventually we left because he was an embarrassment. I mean, when I started to think about this story for Stone Angel, it's like he was trying to tell us something. We went back again a week or so later, he was there again, did exactly the same thing. And it somehow just gave us the idea for this story, but it, it's, it's, it's more abstract than that. It just began to sow the seeds of the story. The next time we went back, we had a camera, and by now we were starting to look at the architecture ourselves and start thinking about doing the story in the cathedral. And he sat down at one point during this time of pursuing us between two women, almost in front of the west window. And so I pretended to take the picture of the west window, but took a picture of him with these, you know, these seats. And when we had it developed, there's nobody sitting there. Nobody sitting in that seat. Not at all. Not at all. It's not even a shadow. The seat is empty, and you know then the story came out of that. But that's how, and I've never seen him since. He's never, been, we've never ever bumped into him again. You never found out what he was no, doing. No, no. Well, I mean, yeah, read the story, you find out what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's all in there. It's all in the story. But um, I really did feel that he did try and um, well, he was trying to tell us, tell me, tell me to write the story. So I did. Because, you know, I mean, after having seen him and then seen that he didn't exist, then, of course, we'd never seen him again. So, you know, it's not like we could ever be scared of him because we just thought he was a pain in the ass, you know, and he, you know, really bothering us in the cathedral. Uh, you know, then, of course, you think, oh, ghost, I'm not going to find this ghost, which is really scary. But, of course, we've been back and he's not there. And we've been back dozens and dozens of times while we were actually doing the story and researching the history and, you know, taking other photographs. And he's just never been back. Nobody else has seen him. No, but the three of us did. It wasn't yeah. that as Doe, just Sheila and I saw yeah. him. You know, so Dennis yeah. saw him as well. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> there you go. So that's, that. that's the basis of that's this year's. Yes, that's this, year, this, yeah. this year's, yes. That was out in um, September. Mm. Yeah. So totally different from, again, from different from else. Yeah, different from Watchgate. The only way it touches the same basis is it's another modern story. Yeah. Mm. And it, but it is set with a couple of characters in, in now, in 1993. Um, yeah. Um, there was a lot of black magic, um, occult stuff, well researched um, in, in Watchgate, The Hand of Glory, um, and, and a lot of the other stuff. I keep on um, by the bed. You do? <laughs> That's for the dog to sleep on. Did, did, you, did you actually have to sort of say, I need to have some black magic in this, I must go out and research it, or was it something that, that you were interested in <coughs> anyway? Well, I think magic is, uh, I think there's quite an undertone of magic in, in our society. I mean, it's there in our life, in our everyday life. I mean, you know, when you, uh, I mean, the weaker throwbacks are, you know, you uh, don't walk under a ladder, you sort of, you know, you see a lucky black cat, you, you count so-and-so and turn around three times if you spill swords and chuck it across your shoulder. I mean. It's, it's all a part of our, you know, sort of our culture, really. So it's just a matter of digging a little bit deeper. Mm. I do a lot of research into the occult, and actually got lots and lots of books, and I've read lots about it. 
find it quite interesting that how much it can influence people's lives. Yeah, but without you really realising, sometimes. Well, I think people, yes, I suppose that's yeah, true. It's sort of subliminal. In um, going back to Alundium, there, there was magic in there, but a, a, a nice magical system. I mean, yes, you had a you had a, a, a magician who could do all sorts of wonderful things. Um, but you had the Granite Kings. How did they come about? I mean, that was a, a wonderful concept, these Granite Kings that actually turned back into stone again. Well, that's a question I find, I find difficult to answer. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it was just a concept that sort of grew out of the top of my head when I was writing that book. I think, you know, granite's a very strong substance. Um, if it weathers, it becomes very brittle. Um, you know, it isn't all enduring. Uh, it has sort of, you know, if you go to sort of granite mountains, they have a great majesty, uh, sense of power. Mm. Um, so that was, I suppose, how it grew. I was more interested in the concept that he was the one who shouldn't have been afraid of the dark and was. Mm. In that, you know, sort of floor. Yeah, the floor in granite, if you like. You know, the, the vein of something else, mm. vein of weakness. It was a, an interesting concept that I mean, we had the you had the traditional baddie, and then these sort of strange. I didn't, I didn't set out to make him Not different human. to be different. He just that was how he grew up as a king. Um, I wanted something that uh, almost would be very different in itself within the story. I mean, the, the, the cloak of jewels that you know became so large that grew each time he plucked a jewel off of it sort of protected and covered him, mm. and covered that, that weakness, if you want, that fear of the dark. Because often, if we are afraid of the dark, if we, if we have something on us, I mean, it's, it's more frightening to be in the dark if you're naked than it is if, you're, if you've got clothes on. Well, it certainly is for me. Yeah, but in the old bit of ghost hunting I've done, I, I wouldn't want to, want to have done undressed, shall we say. Mm. I've always liked to have plenty of clothes on. So the cloak was a way of giving him plenty of clothes and covering the weakness. Yeah. You said you, you ghost hunted. You have time to do much of that? I suppose where you live with it. Um, no, I did this much more when I was oh, 30 years ago. Just I happened to be going out with a girl whose father was the caretaker of an old uh, manor house in, in uh, Kent and we just used to go and hunt ghosts there. Yeah, we had a key to get in after dark, so we did it. And we did it with tape recorders and cameras and everything. We did it what we considered serious. I'm sure you wouldn't con I wouldn't consider it serious now, you know, the way we did it. But it was, it was quite frightening, and I certainly wouldn't want to do it again. Huh? I mean, I do believe in ghosts, and I believe they exist. Um, you know, our present house has, has uh, plenty of ghosts in it. They're all nice ghosts in our present house. Uh, but I think, you know, when you've got a... 16th century coaching in. It's had so many people in and out of it over the years, living there, you know, staying there overnight. And it's just like a great procession of people. It always feels very welcoming. But I've been in places where you feel a really bad atmosphere as well. But then you write about it, you put them in your books. <laughs> you in your books. Um, it's, it's now obviously become a, 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 an established thing that, that you, you, you buy in Mike Jeffrey's book is, is going to be illustrated. Um, you went to Goldsmiths yes. Art College, obviously with the intention of, of, of making a living from art. Yeah, I suppose I always grew up wanting to be a great artist. Um, I didn't realise I was colour blind when I got to college, uh, and so I became an illustrator instead. I did medical art um, at the Royal Marsden Hospital, I did a bit of guys and arts. I couldn't earn a living at it. it very bad and paid. I did enjoy the work, but uh, yeah, I mean, I was an illustrator first. I never considered writing. I didn't know I was dyslexic until I was 14. I just found it very difficult to do anything written, so I would draw rather than write. I would always avoid writing. And I did my thesis, and I got on as a goldsmith, um, but I found that it took me two years to write this small thesis. Working at the BMA, and I'm not to read. I'm working on the notes at home. I now realise why it took me so long you know, because of the dyslexia. I had no idea at the time. You know, I was really, I was just 
struggling in the dark. But, no, I also I think I, I drew because I couldn't find the vehicle to write at the time. Mm. You know, from a small child. Out. I would have thought, though, for, for a man who's colour blind and dyslexic, that a, 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 a writer illustrator is not the easiest profession to end up in. It's like a one legged target. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes, but I mean, it's just the same way as being in that cavalry regiment. I mean, again, being dyslexic and also being left-handed was a real disability because you wanted to be left-handed. Yeah, they needed you to be. Everything was, for a cavalryman, works from the right. Mm. So, you know, you are at a disadvantage. You've got to learn to use the sword with the wrong hand. You've got to learn to use the revolver. You know, it just goes completely against the grain. But you don't, I mean, surely you just do things that, you do whatever's there to be done. You don't often have a choice, do you? You know, life puts these little obstacles in front of you and you just have to climb over them. It's, you know, I could have gone post office robbing or, you know, down the labour exchange or something, I suppose. But, you know, I'd rather do this. I tried the labour exchange once. And I, I got bored of queuing for the money, so I had to do something else. Um, we were talking about creating worlds and doing research. Obviously, it's harder. Um, to set stories in a modern world, um, in a way, because as you say, you've got to get things right. But how do you actually go about creating a fantasy world? I mean, how much reality do you have to put in it? Um, the, the, the marshlands in Glitter Spike, I mean, I've never come across anything quite like that, those wonderful mud hut villages. Did well, that come first? Or? Well, it's like building a house of cards. I mean, you start with something. Um, I suppose I see everything as a picture first, and the writing always comes second. And I would say I, I'm, a, I'm an artist who paints with words now, as opposed to a writer who uses words. You know, it, my work is very visual, I think, mm. when you read it. Glitter Spike Hall started, I'd, done, I'd finished the trilogy, and they were asking, they'd asked me to, to do another trilogy, and I said I didn't want to do another three books with the same characters. I found the last of the trilogy very hard work keeping with the same characters for so long. So I said I'd do two books instead. And we'd taken their middle daughter to a running competition. She used to run for Kent, you know, for the, for the county. And I had no idea even where it was, but we drove to this place that was a very flat um, sort of running, you know, sort of playing fields and some tr low stunted trees. And it was an early morning and there was, so it was misty, it was autumn with mist and a very blue sky. And in the distance was this, I suppose it was a college or something, but uh, certainly an oldish building slightly set up with steep roofs and turrets and everything. And I thought, and, and the way the sun was shining on the roof, I thought, Glitter Spike Hall. And that was the beginning of that two, that two book story. And, and so, you know, the low land I made into marshes. And there was the hall with the, you know, the, the Glitter Spike. And, and I just developed the world around it. The technology obviously had to be medieval. You know, mm. They weren't going to have gas cookers and you know, sort of lotuses or anything like that. Um, I have absolutely no horses. I refuse to have a horse in that story at all um, because I've just done three books with horses in. The people needed to travel. They were marshes. So I thought if we freeze them every night, you could travel anywhere you like. But you've got to roll the dice and find somewhere to go before morning because everything melts in the sunshine and you sink unless you're one of the marshmen and you know your way about. Then there are obviously always tracks. If you go to the fens, I mean, I know guys that live around us who, um, although we're not really in the fens, we're above the fens. I know people there that can find their way through what looks like swamp. You know, they know the paths, and so that's really how, that book, you know, how the landscape evolved. Uh, I read a f we read a few books on um, cooking in medieval times. Um, gave Ansel her background from that. Pinderful birds were just a, an invention off the top of our head. I mean, they just came, you know, mm. that, was, that was easy. You just look at the vultures, you know, sort of, when you're riding horses at these shows, there's always a few circling waiting for the bodies. Um, so they just slipped in, that was it. And the, uh, the marsh beasts, too, were a wonderful <coughs> creation. It was quite shaggy. Yes, yeah, so I agree. But, but not, not evil. Well, no, they were really just a grazing animal. They weren't. There was nothing evil about them. It's, it's like the wolf, isn't it? There's nothing actually evil about the wolf. It's only the way we've interpreted it into and, and, and woven it into our 
you know, culture. And it was the same with the Muppets. There was nothing to fear about. And of course, women had women. Did they did not attack women because women had never hunted them. So the smell of a woman to the beast meant nothing because you know, they, but the smell of a man hunting, um, you know, was enough to send them into a, into a rage. Or, uh, uh, only in defence, but you know, because they were big. I mean, there's a, the picture of one here, the gold picture. That's Yanor, the uh, the beast that was chained to the litter spider that defended Marumia, the king's only daughter. I mean, that story also grew up because um, my father-in-law wasn't, what well, I'd say, really enamoured with women, and he was much more interested in sons than he was in, 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 in daughters. So I, just to be perverse, I gave the king of that story all daughters and no sons. Um, you know, I don't think he ever read the book. Uh, it wasn't he didn't like my stuff, but um, I did do that on purpose. Mm -hmm. And of course, then Yalo had to be the beast that was captured and was set there to defend her for the whole of her life. And you know, she, he looked after she could sleep between his floors, and he would attack. And he was a really nice beast. Mm. I think she sets him free. I can't remember now. It's a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. They um, they were a mixed bunch, the daughters in Bitter Spike, weren't they? Aren't all daughters a mixed bunch? I've got sons. I don't know. <laughs> um. I hope you didn't know too many people like some of those daughters. Um, yes, but we should celebrate our differences as more than our sameness, shouldn't we? Right. So that's all I was trying to do, was just give a cross-section, if you like, of mm. you know, every idiosyncrasy. Um, although Glitter Spike, I suppose one, one, one would say, yes, it's high fantasy, the characters and the way you handle the characters and that are totally different to Alundia. The characters, you'll pardon me saying so, are, are a lot more real in Glitter Spike. They, they, they address, there's a, a wonderful row between the, the hero and the heroine. She's, she's cast out um, because she dared to, 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 to go for the, the kingship and daughters, women were, were nothing in this society. And she's bemoaning the fact that she can't do anything. And the hero turns around and says, well, look, are you more interested in actually getting what you want or just sitting there going, well, I'm only a woman? Um, how come the characters, it, it's more character-driven in Glitter Spike than in, in the original Alundium well, stories? I think writing, yeah, if you are writing, it should be a vehicle to, to redress and to, to exercise life as we see it, and, and you know the situations as we see them. And if you don't do that, then what's the point in? You know, you're just painting a pretty picture. If you're not, um, you know, peeling back the layers, if you like, on people's, you know, on the psyche, um, you know, and, and trying to to explore real situations. And people are afraid of stepping out and doing things. Often, when they're given the chance, is the time they're most afraid to do it. You know, believing you're going to do something, and you and saying you're going to do something and doing it. I mean, you know, there's a very big gulf there. I remember at university, you know, everybody, I didn't have a grant to start with and I slept rough on the streets and I lost a lung through it and I was down to six stone. And everybody began to help me, um, you know, because they felt I really was going to work for this art degree. And quite soon after that, when I sat the first examination, the intermediate examination, I was really afraid of letting everybody down. And there was a great part of me that actually wanted to not ever go into that room and sit the exam, but just disappear, move to a new town, take up a new identity, and do something very ordinary. But because I tried to get this qualification, all these people have backed me, there was that moment when I was going to let everybody down, and that was a terrifying moment. It took more courage, I think, to walk into that room that morning. And nobody else knew but me how afraid I was mm. than, say, sitting up here this morning in front of an audience, you know, which is daunting in itself, but, you know, in a sense, I can't let any of you down, or perhaps I can let you down, but, you know, I don't know you all personally enough to actually personally let you down, but I could let everybody down that morning, and that's sort of what she was going to do if, you know, by not seizing the kingship, if you like, and proving that she was worthy enough, or good enough, I mean, word is a bad word, but, 
you know, that she had as much right to it as you like, as a human being. I mean, that's what I meant. Mm. And I'm very much for equality, of, you know. Uh, I mean, I'm totally polit politically incorrect almost all the time, and I can make a study of it. But I do very much for equality, and I always have been. I've worked for a lot of women and found them to be great bosses, and a lot of men, you know. I mean, I, it doesn't matter to me whether it's a man or a woman. It's whether you're good or bad at the job that's more important. Mm. But you can put the, you can write this into books, like in that instance, you know, make people think, yeah, I could do that. No? Yeah, but it, it was nice. It's nice to have a heroine that was a woman, and, and not just a sort of man with curb bits. Um, which I think, you know, a lot of men, if they want to write strong women, I think just tend to do the kind of, you know, you've seen these sword and sorcery chainmail yeah. bikini types. Yeah, I'd never thought of any of my. Um, yeah, I don't think I would want to write a, a man with curved bits in any of my stories. I would. <laughs> I would. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. Clive has lots of friends with curved bits. Yeah. <laughs> I think how you sort of um, put me off completely now. <laughs> <laughs> the black hole is spreading. <laughs> I think when I wrote Watchgate, I tried to take a, 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 a woman there who, who had it all, who one could almost say was a call of the glass, say was a bimbo, if one could define bimbo itself. The natural fact was the complete opposite of this. And having it all can make you a very, very lonely person and can make you as isolated as having absolutely nothing. I mean, it's the complete extreme. And, you know, to write about either from either extreme, I, I think is quite challenging. And in, um, in Stone Angels, the heroine, in that, um, I take from the other complete extreme, you know, a woman who's uh, a young woman who's, you know, her parents have great aspirations for her. They, they sort of, they are in command of driving her life. And the one thing she wants to do is, is not do and be the person they want her to be. So she has to completely drop out. She has to completely vanish. And she becomes one of this sort of group of squatters in Norwich. I mean, the only place she can be totally anonymous and away from it. And in fact, as far as her parents are concerned, she's dead. They think she's dead. And because they thought she'd been kidnapped and killed, and she's now been on the run for some years, you know, she's living this completely anonymous life. She, you know, she's a uniform. She's terrified because she doesn't want to be found. And each time she's not found, the ramifications of what would happen if she was found, the guilt, the recriminations, you know, make the whole situation so much worse. So she's, she's living, in a sense, a shadow of her own, of, of the life that she had. And that was as much challenging as, as you know, mm. writing uh, Tuppence in Watchgate and, and Rooney in, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I like writing about Rooney. Yes, I'm, I must admit, uh, as a woman, starting, like starting with Tuppence, Trilby, um, my first reaction was, was to bar. Um, <laughs> and I Somebody thought, oh no, another, another bimbo. Um, but things certainly didn't turn out the way that I expected them to. I mean, it, was an, it was an interesting character. She turned into a, a really interesting character because of this. She, on the outside, had everything. But on the inside, she had nothing no. because of having everything. But I know lots of guys like this. I don't know too many women like this, but I know guys who have spent so much time making so much money and having so much power, and then they suddenly look around them on a Sunday afternoon. There's absolutely nobody they can trust or talk to. You know, nobody they can say that they're a real friend. Everybody's always wanting something. Mm. You know, you don't. You lose a lot of things on the way if you're getting that much power to keep, you know, real friendship. Is something that's quite, I think, quite difficult to do. I mean, I've noticed a little way with, I mean, the small success I've had with the writing. The number of parties you get invited to, or dinner parties, and you're not introduced as Mike any longer, you're only introduced as the writer. You know, you think, Christ, I'm only here as the writer. You know, I thought these people like me. They don't like me, they like what I do. Mm. You know, nobody introduces you as Mike anymore. This is the writer you must have heard, have heard of. And you're thinking, Christ, I don't want to be here for that. You know, 
never actually walked out yet, but I, I have actually once or twice felt that I'd like to. You know, your circle shrinks. Well, for Tappan's in the book, her circle had become the size of the ring. Mm. But hers had as well, in a completely different way. When you get round to reading it. When I get round to reading it. On sale in the, uh, must be on oh, sale. Oh, yes, it's on sale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Plug, plug, on sale. In the dealer's room. <laughs> so after this, what next? Um, we've just finished a reincarnation novel. Uh, thanks. I've got quite, I, I do feel I've been here before. Um, and I feel I'll come back and maybe get some of the things done I haven't done this time. The real downer is I don't remember that much about last time or the time before, or the time before. But you just get odd, odd flashes. Um, and I think that, in a sense, drove us to do this book, which is called Children of the Flame, which comes out next next year. It is finished. I mean, I, I was born during an air raid. I was evacuated to a, bomber, to, uh, a little village beside a bomber station in Lancashire. The whole of my life, I've been obsessed with the noise of aero engines. If I hear them, it just makes my heart beat faster. It's just something within me that sort of, it's like I hear this, this, this triumphant shout, and I will always run to the window to watch them. I can't help it. At 50 years old, I'm still as obsessed as when I was a 10-year-old boy. There's something in there, and I always thought it was because I was born during that period and it's a sound, you know, as a child, I must have heard a million times, you know, in my cot. Uh, I mean, the fact that the, the hospital was actually bombed as I was being delivered and the ceiling came in and my mother had a leg broken and I was whisked out on a, on a you know, trolley with, between her legs with one broken leg with covered in ceiling plaster, I think, when I was still wet from being born. <coughs> I don't know if that has anything to do with it. But as I wrote this reincarnation book, I mean, I again knew Second World War aeroplanes, and I'm writing a bit about this plane when it, it, it's destroyed. Only all the time I'm writing about it, I'm never writing about it from outside the plane, I am inside the plane, and in my head, I'm sitting there, and I know exactly how it feels to have this thing fall apart around me. The noises, the smells, everything. I mean, call me crazy if you want, but it's such a strong trace memory, if you like, that I have. And now I've written it out, I feel a lot better about it. But until I got to that part of the book, other things I struggled with, that whole bit just came out in one lump, and I just rode that thing down into eternity. I felt the heat, you know. I, it, a little bit of it was in, in Cellos in the Watchgate, but I had no idea as I was writing that, that I was in a sense writing maybe about myself in the most recent life. And the reason that I've been so obsessed with that is maybe I, I was killed in an aeroplane and I stepped straight into this life, you know? I mean, it was so close that, I mean, who knows? Who can tell? I can't tell. But I had to write about it. So this, you know, that book has meant a lot to me to do. And that one's illustrated as well? Uh, I'm just doing the illustrations, yeah. I mean, it's a game very much involved with um, witchcraft and curses and magic. And two people that meet for 700 years. They keep meeting, two souls keep joined, coming together, trying to break this curse as well. I won't tell you what that about it. <laughs> I haven't bought anything from that to read, but yeah. no, I'm just re doing the rewrites now for that. And I'm doing a, a ghost story set in our house. That's the one after mm. that, which I've just started. So it's, it's you all the time then, the, the departure from high fantasy gets, gets further and further. Are you yeah. under, under any pressure to, uh, to they, write any more of the original stuff? They would like me to, to do another uh, trilogy. Um, they've sort of hinted that they would pay me more money to do that than what they're paying me to do this. I sort of, it's nice to take the money and run. And I did some research on chivalry. I thought I'd write one about chivalry. But I think it would be just even darker than Little Spy Call. It, it immediately becomes dark. You know, I just can't, I don't think I could write something as light as The Road to Alundium now. It, it mm. Immediately I see the, the darker sides of the characters as I'm starting to place people in the chivalry book. Um, 
you know, they're already becoming sort of darker than these characters in these modern books, and so maybe it's not a good thing to try and step backwards. You don't think the publishers would, would accept a dark fantasy? I mean, Tolkien did pretty well, I think. No, but Tolkien isn't as dark as... Well, Tolkien is really quite a light fantasy. I mean, everything gets quite well in the end, doesn't it? Well, sort of. I mean, Mervyn Peak, if you Not take exactly Gormenghast, you know, the Gormenghast stuff, I mean, that is an awful lot darker, and it took an awful lot longer to get going. Mm. I know he, unfortunately, went and died on a sword, and, you know, couldn't produce any more work, but the actual story itself, I mean, the, the, the Gormenghast trilogy is a trilogy, isn't mm. it? Yes, I'm, I'm Titus Grove and Titus Alone, and what's the other one? The Gormenghast. Yes, it, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it's a great story, but it was a very slow starter. Um, you know, it's, it's being revitalised now. Mm -hmm. You've got the, the sort of um, the Timothy Tolkien Association you know, promoting that work and making it it's the one book everybody's read if they've read fantasy. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think I really want to step backwards and do that stuff. I'd much rather step on and do... Because I'll probably now go and do something like that. Mm -hmm. No, I'd rather get it to... I don't know what the next one will be yet. I mean, after the ghost one. You know, that's only just started, so I don't like to, to, to think too far ahead, obviously. You've got so much you're holding up here. The one thing about this lecture is it gives you a very bad retentive memory. And when I joined the fire brigade, they thought, ah, a writer, great. They had a solicitor, a writer, and a screen printer in the village that, you know, the, the three of us, apart from all the other guys. They thought, well, I must be good for the quiz because, you know, I'm a writer, I must be bright. So they immediately put me on the quiz team. And I just can't retain any of this meaningless stuff. I mean, it just goes in and comes straight out the other side. And even the phonetic alphabet, you know, this A for alpha, B, I, I just couldn't remember it. I just had no clue. I lost all points on that in any of the questions. You know, because you write doesn't necessarily mean you're bright or, you know, Mm. Another stereotype then, but... Uh, well, I mean, you know, the dyslexia it is a problem. I suppose you... Do you write the word processor? No, I handwrite it. And Sheila takes it and puts it on the word processor. I do it in two colours. Blue, and then I overwrite with red for my alterations. And when the 60% red on the page, I rewrite it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's a good system. Well, because otherwise even I can't. I mean, I, I don't have. I can't read. I can't read it the next day. It's such a mess anyway. So it has to be, you know, done the same day. If there's a question, it has to be done on that day. You said you brought some uh, some bits to read for us. Would, would you read? Well, them? I mean, do you want? Would you like me to? You know, drop off the sleep now. <laughs> I'm reading for me because of the dyslexia. It's rather like the the, the blind man leading his dog. All right. Um, I haven't practiced any of these because I wasn't sure if you want me to read. I'll read you something from Stone Angel, shall I, since that's the newest one. This is, um, it's when Joni, who is this woman who's dropped out, it's when she first meets the Stone Angel. I mean, there are two angels, but it's when she meets the the bad angel. She's been at a party in this squat. She's, um, she was more or less forced to take some drugs against her will. Well, I mean, she just didn't like the guy who was handing them out. And um, she fell out of the window into the cathedral grounds. And um, yeah, she's come to some hours later. It's a, it's a closed, close. When the big gates are closed, there's basically no way out back up into the window she fell out of, but the party's broken up, everybody's gone to sleep. So bear with me, folks. <clears throat> the patter of raindrops suddenly grew heavier. Rumbles of distant thunder broke the silence. The storm was returning, sweeping back across the sleeping city, with jagged fingers of lightning stroking the night, etching the huge bulk of the cathedral in stark outline against the sky. Joni had to find shelter, and quickly, before the rain soaked through her clothes and chilled her to the bone. But when the thunder pealed loudly and a barrage of lightning flashed and crackled, momentarily illuminating the soaring spire and sending fleeting shadows from the startled gargoyles which poised on every gutter spout, 
It highlighted the high arches of the flying buttresses and picked out the intricate stone tracery on the stained glass windows. The light flickered and faded into rumbling darkness behind the cathedral. She watched as the lightning died away and remembered that the outer doors to the south porch were probably still unlocked, the same ones that she had used to slip out of the cathedral late in the afternoon of the day before. As she ran through the worsening deluge, she hoped that Mary hadn't bothered to get out of her bed of newspapers to throw the boats before she fell asleep. She's a tramp that's sleeping in there. Joni reached the oak doors and grasped the large iron ring in her left hand and threw a weight against it as she turned. The latch lifted and the heavy door groaned. It creaked open an inch. She breathed a sigh of relief and leant her weight fully against it, peering into the gloomy interior of the porch as it slowly opened. The inside of the porch was dimly lit by the glow of a single bulb. The low wattage bulb was barely visible through the shroud of cobwebs and dust that clung to the glass, but it cast enough light for Joey to see the two broad stone benches that flanked either side of the tiny vestibule. Opening the outer door obviously hadn't disturbed Mary. She could hear her snoring as loudly as a rusty chainsaw, but it took her a few moments to pick out the top of her woolen bonnet and the straggle of dirty grey hair as she lay, or rather sprawled, along the left-hand bench, underneath a sea of crumpled newspapers and pieces of old Hessian sacking that served her as a blanket. The carrier bags that contain, contained all her possessions had fallen over and spilled their contents untidily across the flagstone floor. Joni stepped in over the threshold and came out of the rain before she reached for the latch to push the door shut, but she hesitated wrinkling her nose at the overpowering stench of decay that seemed to waft through the porch, and she left it slightly open. If it hadn't been pouring with rain, she would have retraced her steps, but she had to keep dry, and reluctantly she began to pick her way towards the right-hand bench through the grey, mouldy crusts of bread and battered food tins that had fallen out of the bulging carrier bags. Something moved in the shadows beneath Mary's bench, and the baked bean can rolled sideways. It buckled open top catching the feeble light. A large rat, disturbed in its scavenging, gave a high-pitched squeal as it ran between Joni's feet and fled out over the threshold into the rain of darkness. She jumped. A shudder of revulsion made her teeth rasp together, but she fought to stifle the scream and forced it back down her throat. She was afraid to wake Mad Mary, afraid that she would drive her out into the rain. Stepping quickly through the mess on the floor, she reached the empty bench and sat down. Rumbles of thunder were breaking directly overhead, and the lightning flashed in brilliant illuminating sheets across the lawns. A chill wind had risen and it was blowing the rain in a fine soaking mist through the open door of the porch. It glistened on the stone bench in the cold light of the lamp and formed a fine film on her denim jacket. Joni shivered and moved further into the corner away from the door and into the shadows, her knees drawn up to her chin. She huddled tightly in cold misery her back against the rough stone wall of the transept as she watched the storm through the open door and listened to the ribbon of the rain drumming on the roof of the porch above her head. Despite trembling with cold, she began to feel drowsy and her eyelids felt heavy and began to close. Her head nodded forwards and fell onto her knees. She was rapidly drifting, slipping into a light, fitful sleep, lulled by the sound of the rain drumming on the roof. It was beginning to blend in her mind into soft, swelling waves of music. Suddenly, another sound, a sharp metallic click, invaded her fading consciousness. It made her start to wait and blink. She turned her head to stare at the doors that led into the transept. She could have sworn that the sound that had woken her was someone trying to lift the latch from inside the transept. The echo of the noise was still in her head, and a cold shiver of fear travelled up her spine. She listened intently as she tried to calm her racing heart. There couldn't be anybody in the cathedral. The place had been cleared of visitors and locked up hours ago. Anyway, it was pitch dark in there. Nobody in their right mind would want to stay in there all night. She had almost convinced herself that the noise must have been the thunder or a severe crackle of lightning, and she was settling back to watch the storm when the iron ring set in the door closest to her began to turn slowly. The latch lifted halfway, and the heavy oak door groaned on its hinges and shook, but the latch held. A knot of panic tightened in Joni's stomach. Her imagination crowded and teemed with half-seen images of ghosts and ghouls that might haunt the dead hours of the night. 
The handle turned again and the door rattled violently against the latch as it began to creak open inch by inch. Mary turned fitfully in her sleep, disturbed by the noise. The overpowering stench of decay that Joni had smelt when she had first opened the outer door of the porch billowed through the widening gap, ruffling the newspapers that covered the tramp as it blew through the porch. Weird in human whispers and the rush of footsteps poured out of the darkened transept. Mary knew that she had to get out of there, and she leapt to her feet. She was about to make a dash for the outer door when the draft from the opening doors behind her slammed it shut, cutting off her escape. She dropped to her knees and scrambled under the stone bench in desperation and terror. She pressed herself into the shadows. The inner doors creaked fully open, and she watched in horror as a horde of demonic creatures with claws and hideously deformed bodies swarmed across the floor towards where Mary lay asleep. Joni swallowed the scream of terror that was clawing its way up out of her lungs and bit hard on the knuckles of her right hand. She had to be hallucinating. This nightmare had to be caused by the residue of the drugs in her bloodstream. They were conjuring up monstrous creations from the pits of hell. She fought to overcome her panic, knowing that it would only multiply and intensify the visions. In her mind, if she didn't do something to destroy the illusion before it got a real hold on her. But what could she do? Huddled beneath the bench, she felt so helplessly alone, so trapped. Then she remembered that sometimes if you reached out and confronted the hallucination, touched whatever ever was terrifying you, it destroyed it. As she hesitated, they looked so terrifyingly real as they reached out, as they reached the other bench and began to claw at the loose ends of the newspapers that covered Mary. One of them jumped up, hooking its claws into her hair, its voice rising in an excited chatter. Joanie forced herself to remember that they were only there in her imagination, that she only had to reach out to banish them. Then suddenly she froze. Beads of cold perspiration broke out on her forehead. She might be hallucinating these creatures, but she hadn't opened the doors to the transept or imagined the overpowering sense of decay. Illusions, no matter how bizarre and how frightening, had to start with the thread of reality, no matter how tenuous. There had to be someone or something in the transept, something that was making that low-pitched whirring noise that was getting louder and louder and setting her teeth on edge. Mary awoke with a cry and sat bolt upright, scattering her blanket of newspapers and shouting a string of obscene curses as she snatched at what she thought was a rat whose claws were tangled in her hair. Get off! Get off, you fucking bastard! She screamed, tearing the creature free and hurling it with all her strength against the far wall. The creature hit the wall hard and let out a snarling shriek as it slithered down onto the bench at her feet. It lay quivering for a moment and let back at her, its claws outstretched and its eyes glowing red, its hideous mouth and razor-sharp teeth gaping open. Mary stared at it, blinking her bleary eyes in confusion and trying to scramble, ba scramble backwards along the bench, raising her hand to protect her face. She was trying to ward off its renewed attack when a chilling voice hissed out of the darkness of the transept. Ishtas, be still, she is mine to sacrifice. The demon stopped, its mouth snarling and twitching, dribbling hot trails of saliva. It jumped onto her stomach and crouched, baring its fangs, pinning her onto the bench with its long talons. Mary screamed and struggled violently, trying desperately to break free, but her terrified eyes were now focused on something above and behind the head of the grotesque creature that was sweating, squatting heavily on her stomach. Mother of Jesus! Lord have mercy, she cried, repeating the words over and over again until they blurred into a jumble of incoherent gasps. She cowered and stared wildly up at something that was advancing towards her through the open doors, its huge shadow slowly engulfing her. Joni watched in terror. Joni watched the terror widen across the face of the old vagrant and edge forward as far as she dared in the cramped space beneath the bench. Twisting her head to one side, she looked up and her breath froze in her veins. Towering above her, its outspread wings brushing against the walls of the porch, she saw the dark angel in the feeble glow of the lamp. Its skin looked as smooth and as black as death. It was holding a length of broken chain between its hands, letting it swing loosely as it advanced. There was nothing angelic in its sinister face. Its eyes were narrow, glistening slits, its mouth a snarling line of hate, as it paused above the cowering woman. It spoke in a hard, menacing voice. Istaz, Akabal, guardians of the gates of hell, hold the sacrifice still. The demons swarmed up from the floor onto the bench, their voices rising in a pitiless shriek, a 
as they grasped hold of Mary's failing arms and legs, their sharp talons tearing through her ragged clothing, puncturing her skin as they stretched and restrained her. Take care, the angel hissed angrily. Do not let her bleed wantonly. Her blood must be used to anoint the bloodstone. The beat of its wings began to lessen as it descended to straddle the old woman, its muscular legs and feet planted firmly on either side of her narrow chest. Joni watched, paralysed with horror. The gigantic, sinister figure, now astride the old vagrant, looked like the dark statue of the kneeling angel that she had hidden behind in the transept the day before. But that wasn't possible. Statues couldn't come to life. Something told her this wasn't an hallucination or a nightmare. Whatever was happening was terrifyingly real. The angel folded its wings across its back, its feathers grating softly together as it bent forwards, a cold, pitiless smile curling its lips. It reached down and caressed the old woman's terrified face with a clenched fist, letting the heavy chain tear at her ragged clothes as it traced the contours with its knuckles and whispered, Shamil, the moon is in the twelfth house. It is time to wet the bloodstone and awaken you from your ageless exile. Suddenly the soft whispers turned into a shriek of cruel laughter. The angel threw back its head and shouted out Samuel's name and the caressing hand quivered as it wound the chain around Mary's throat. She screamed, twisting her head violently from side to side as she tried to escape from the strangling grip. Her eyes bulged, her face blackened and her tongue protruded between her teeth in a choking gasp as the angel drew its hands apart, tightening the chain and crushing her larynx with a final brutal jerk. Mary's body convulsed, her back arched, and her hands and feet twitched against the claws that held them. Suddenly her mouth snapped shut, her few remaining blackened teeth cutting through her tongue. Trickles of blood darkened her swollen lips and ran down her chin, hissing and bubbling as they spread across the black iron links of the chain and soaked into the knuckles of the angel's strangling hands. It shook its victim violently, hurling her up into the air, dislodging the demons and scattering them across the stone bench as it cried out, it is time to await, Shamil. I, Abaddon, the angel of darkness, summon you to arise. Joni was trembling incontrollably, uncontrollably from head to foot in the darkness beneath the bench. There was a knot of revulsion in her stomach at what she had just witnessed, and it was beginning to travel up towards the back of her throat. She was going to be sick, but the terror of being discovered made her fight to swallow the bile. Her eyes were watering in an effort not to cough or gasp too loudly for air and give herself away. The small demonic creatures began to dance in a howling, leaping, shadowy circle around the angel's feet, chanting its name over and over again, round and round, faster and faster, their scrabbling claws moved. Awake, Samir, Abaddon cried, dropping the chains and stabbing his right hand brutally at Mary's chest. Ear-splitting rumbles of thunder drowned out the sound, the sound of bone shattering, and then the shearing flash of lightning. <coughs> The leaping shadows that followed, Joni saw the angel's arm rise and fall and hold aloft the old lady's heart, the blood running between its fingers as it held it high above its head. Shamil, Shamil, I now anoint the bloodstone. And the baddon squeezed the ruptured heart with all its strength, anointing its head with a thin trickle of blood that split in a narrow, darkening stain down through its tousled curls and across its forehead, cheeks and neck, hissing and bubbling as it soaked into its skin. There is not enough, the angel cursed, searching the feathers of its wings for the darker, wetter shades of red that would show that the bloodstone was fully anointed. Vainly, a baton rubbed the heart all over its head and shoulders, but the stain would not spread. Be still, the angel hissed, holding up his hand to the leaping, dancing circle of demons. They suddenly stopped. Their heads turned expectantly towards the open doors that led into the transept. It was as if they were listening, waiting for some long awaited football, footfall before they performed their much-practiced rite. The silence lengthened, broken only by the distant rumble of thunder and the rattle of the rain on the roof overhead. The angel fell to its knees and offered up the limp body of the old woman, holding her towards the open doors. Shamil, I have failed you, it called out in a desolate, despairing voice. I have chosen badly that there is not enough blood in this sacrifice to wet the bloodstone and resurrect you from eternal darkness. The silence seemed to deepen, muffling even the patter of the raindrops on the roof. Wearily Abaddon rose and let Mary's body slip from his outstretched fingers into the waiting claws of the monstrous little creatures that crowded at his feet. Take her, devour the husk of the sacrifice and bury her bones. 
We must wait, sleeping in secret, until the frosts of midwinter have clothed us in a sparkling shroud, before we try again to anoint the bloodstone. Remove all trace of the body. The angel hissed, gathering up the chain as it strode into the cathedral, without a backward glance at the swarm of demons as they shrieked and chattered and clamoured all over the old vagrant's body. Joni strutted with revulsion as they slowly pulled and dragged the carcass after the angel into the darkened transept. Watching the demons devour Mary's body was more than she could bear. Her sight blurred, her head swam dizzily, and she blacked out, her head striking the cold stone floor. The vile picture of them stripping the old woman to the bone followed her into merciful oblivion. There you go. <coughs> it's really a food story. <laughs> Food fetish with a difference, yes. Um, I'd like to open it out to the floor at this point. Um, is there anyone who would like to put a point to mind by asking a question on what we've been talking about? What have we been talking about? Oh, we've been wittering on quite happily here for about an hour, but. Ask. Which do you find more. Um, sorry. Which do you find more satisfying to yourself? The art to match the fiction or, or doing a piece of fiction that suits the artwork? Well, they come in tandem. I mean, the, 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 the drawings and the, are done while the work's in progress. Or the ideas for the drawings are done. But the, the finished artwork tends to be done afterwards. Started and gone sort of down the road and thought, no, that's not working and stopped on. And if so, yeah. why? What do you mean, a piece of writing or a writing or, or art? Uh, well, you take a lot of false turns when you're, well, I do, when I'm doing a book. Uh, characters will try to write themselves into positions you don't want, often write themselves as taller or better looking, or, you know, sometimes even with, with grass skirts and things. <laughs> For yeah. those, yeah, say, for those that don't know, Mike's a, a friend of Adrian Cole, which uh, they obviously share this grass fetish. For those that have been to previous online comments, no, I only heard about it yesterday. It's <laughs> resurrected today. No, you're always, you know, the work is evolving and changing all the time you're doing it. So often you're taking back the turns, you know, going forwards again. Oh, I've got a question. Um, uh, do you ever, does it ever affect you, your work? Do you have nightmares or dreams? Do you dream about your work? I dream about it if I have problems with it, sometimes. Um, no, I don't. No, otherwise it doesn't really bother me. You don't, don't watch the shadows? <laughs> yes, I've always been a bit afraid of the shadows, I suppose. No, I don't like the dark, which you know, in the fire brigade when you have to work in the dark. I'm not very good at that. Um, you know, I have to lot I have to summon up a lot of courage to to go into um, you know, dark situations, especially smoky dark situations. It's very claustrophobic. Yes, sometimes I'm afraid of the dark. Do the dreams help you with your problems? Do you get ideas from your dreams? Yeah, sometimes, but I wouldn't say it's particularly important. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it helps and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, if a book takes you, say, seven to eight months to write it, then there's going to be lots of various things that influence it and don't influence it in that time. And because one dream happened to once influence it at one moment, it may change something you do in ten pages. It hasn't necessarily changed the whole book. Although that ten pages could change the whole book, you know, in retrospect. What's your ambition, Mike? Um, to live forever? No, I don't <laughs> live forever. Um, I think to just to keep exploring the ideas that fill my mind. And for people to read and enjoy them. Do you see Italian? I don't have any more ideas. No. I can get an idea in the morning. I mean, that, 
I think that a lot of writers are continually telling the same story. They have one really good idea when they start, and that's what they, they then tend to, to exercise in lots of different ways for the rest of their writing career. I would say I'm a storyteller in the traditional sense, that we would sit around a fireside and tell a story. Um, because you know, in our modern day, you, know, you tell one story here, it's filmed, and you know, it can be shown off in dozens of places or, or through the medium of the book. Everybody's read it within a year, so you have to tell another story. In medical times, you the same story you took to the next fireplace, didn't you? But, you know, as a storyteller, I don't feel I'm anywhere near running out of ideas yet. In fact, actually, I think they're getting better. So you, you're actually rather pleased then that you, you're not locked anymore into this fantasy trilogy, followed by another trilogy, followed by a... Because um, that's got to be easier to do, isn't it? It's a constant fight um, with the publishers to do what you want, as opposed to what they want you to do. Because after all, they're, I mean, they're in the business of selling books, not necessarily you know, creating ideas, mm. your ideas. And you know, they will look at. I mean, they've got to look at the profit and loss margin of the book, as opposed to what necessarily is the is the idea within the book. And they're obviously looking for books that are high earners. And you know, what one might want to do is not necessarily a high earner. At the moment you do it, it might become a high earner, but then that's their gamble. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of. I find there's a lot of pressure to do stuff I don't want to do, but I can basically sweep that aside. It's just as long as I can afford to live on what I pay me. And then I'm told oh, I'll be on my pension soon, oh. you know, and I can just write purely for, for you know for pleasure as and when I want. Mm. I have felt in the last ten years I've been like a hamster on a wheel doing a book a year. Um, I would like to take maybe two two years on a book sometimes, which I haven't been able to do, more or less because of the contractual obligations that I've written myself into. But that's coming to an end now, so you know I have time to maybe do one in two years instead. I might still do a book here, I don't know. I just feel I want to go out and see other places and explore a bit. And, you know, I don't want to write about Norwich too many more times. Or East Anglia, I you know, want to set my book somewhere else. So I need to go and see these places. Mm. You can try Dartmoor from here. Then. Yes, well, I think this area has a lot of you know, feeling about it, you know, sort of from the southwest. I've always had a liking for that here. Or America. I mean, I nearly set one in America last year. Could you con your publishers into sort of, you know, saying, I want to write this book about Bali or the Fiji Islands? Or well, you can say that, but they just say, get stuffed. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they say, yes, if you want to do it, go and do it, and then we'll buy the book off when you come back. <laughs> uh, they won't actually. Cornwall. Cornwall, yeah. Cathedral. But there's a lot of atmosphere in this part of the world. Yeah. You know, I mean, I haven't, I haven't been to Cornwall since 30 years. But the whole of the southwest I've liked, always liked. But then, see, when I went to Norfolk, I had no idea I'd write two books about it, set there, NC in Norwich. But it just seemed the right place to do it. I mean, the one I'm doing now, I'm doing in the village. Not, the, yes, the ghost story is set in my village. But of course, I'm moving my village. You know, I need it more in the fence for the story. You now, you start off, you think, yes, I'm going to write a story about this house. It's a great house, it's been here since 1650. Um, you know, there's so much I know about the history of the house and the people that have lived there and uh, right up to modern day. But then once you start to write it, you need to move it because, you, you know, the, it just needs to be moved. It's almost difficult to explain it. Maybe it's because there are other things you want to add to the story that won't fit in where it is. You see in Shadows of the Watchgate, it's my village I describe, but there's no river in my village. There's no pub called the Gallows. It's called the Rose and Crown. And also, my village is too far from Norwich to be called to a fire as the first pump of, you know, attending. So I had to move the whole village. So I had to call the village something different. You know, because people will say it can't be that village because it's not there. So you have a fictitious village that can be anywhere. So, you know, things move around a lot. But you're allowed to do it. You're sort of playing God, really. You like a high body count as you'd see from the little bit I read. Doesn't Lady you Your Own House run the risk that you'll have all the Americans turning up on the doorstep wanting to look at your living room? Yeah, but I'm selling it, you see. I'm not giving that title. That's the next people's yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's their problem, not mine. And I'm even calling it what it is. And so, yeah, I mean, they can, they can knock on the door. I don't mind. Very polite. 
you know, it's just they, um, they, they, they turn it into a guest house, they could make a fortune. You know? <laughs> Assuming the book's as popular as that one was with the Americans. It's all very well basing things um, more or less on reality, but do you actually get problems with, 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 with people that perhaps perceive themselves as being part of your book and they say, well, you know, this, this isn't me? Um, I've had a little bit of that. I had it with taxidermist. He was very upset because he said he's nothing like that. I mean, the story was not about him. I only used his shop as the, the place to set the scene. Uh, we had to get him drunk at the launch party because he turned up shouting how unlike him it was and how upset he was. And, uh, when he com became completely legist, it was fine. So, uh, I think, the, uh, actually, the more um, embarrassing thing with, with real-life people is so many people say to you, can you write me into your stories? I want a part in one of your stories. And you think, well, <laughs> there's nothing remarkable enough about you <laughs> to put in one of my stories. It's not that they're not really nice people. It's just that they wouldn't fit anywhere I want. You know, and how do you say that to somebody? Mm. You know, well, no, you know, you're too poor, I don't want you in my stories. It's not that they really are, but how do you explain that they just don't cut it for a character? Well, you say to some of your obnoxious little unpersonal Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they go, Well, this is the lovely approach. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I still want them to buy me a beer, you see. <laughs> oh, well, you, you saved the son of your uh, oh, obnoxious right. little unpersonal until after you had your beer. Right, that's it. <laughs> oh, I knew I was doing something wrong. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was being facetious. Maybe that's the difference between a fantasy writer and a horror writer, then, No, no. I, I get simple. People want to be vampires. Mike Lee is a vampire. I've got, I've got a lady at the moment, a coloured lady, very beautiful black lady, who, uh, what's her name? Janine. Janine. And with a ridiculous spelling of the name, too, but perfect for her. Uh, but uh, there's no way I've thought about it, I can't, so you know, I'm going to have to avoid her for the rest of my life. <laughs> I promise that I will. And of course, you say also, you say to people, yes, yes, sure, I'll put you in, you know, if, you, if they're being particularly pressing. Then they attack you a year later when the book comes out. They say, I'm not in it. I'm not anywhere in this book. <laughs> and you're thinking, yeah, first of all, you've got to try and remember what you said they would be. And then you've got to make some, if, some excuse, if they're particularly pressing, why they're not there or who they are, but they haven't seen themselves <laughs> yet. Yeah, and then you've got to remember it for the next time you see them as well. And that can be that can be. So if you ever decide then to write a sword and sorcery with a voluptuous, tall, blonde in chainmail bikini, oh no, it's, it's me, yours. really. It's your place. <laughs> it's your place. Wow. I mean, you can get it. You can. You have to be careful about writing about people that you do know and are real. I mean, in Stone Angels, there's a doctor in it. Uh, I suppose it's a fairly major part um, with heart. So he has this long sideboard and this sort of demonic grin, and he really does exist. He is my doctor in our village, um, Martin Wilson. He's as mad as a hatter. He wears this sort of long, sort of um, Wild West sort of coat. You could see him riding shotgun in any one of John Wayne's films, and that's the way he treats you medically as well. You know, as though it's going to be you're going to be under attack, and the wagon train has been surrounded. I mean, it tends to be basic medicine. He is a really, really nice guy. Well, I wrote about him. I gave him my old car as his car um, and made him very eccentric in the story. And when I finished it, I gave him a copy to read and I said, I hope you don't mind. I did change his name to Martin Burr as opposed to Martin Wilson because um, Wilson just didn't seem to fit. And I sort of held my breath while he read, you know, he took it away and came back. And he said, yes, it's me and I regret nothing. It's great. I'm glad you've done it. And, that was, and I was very relieved about that. But my old lep teacher at school who lives near my college, Goldsmiths, in London, I wanted to use his road for the characters in this year, in the reincarnation book, um, you know, somewhere where my he heroes, you know, the Western people lived. And his name was the landlord, and he totally objected to it and was very aggressive. You know, I mean, it surprised me how aggressive he was about not even using his road, let alone his name. So I wrote back and said, well, Sheila wrote back as, our secretary um, with her maiden name and said that um, we wouldn't use the name at all in the book, either his name or the road name, and that um, my publishers will put a rider in front saying that any reference to this 
Lane and Rowan was nothing to do with Mr. and Mrs. Langley, you see. <laughs> he wrote a very irate letter back saying that completely defeats the purpose, which of course it does. But, you know, um, people can be, I suppose, funny about that. You know, some people you feel, they feel offended if you ask them because, well, of course you could have done, and others, if you do it without asking, they're, you know, offended the other way. It's a difficult one, that. Any other questions? Time to wind up? Oh, I think it's definitely Good. time to wind up. <laughs> That's it. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. You stayed awake. Brilliant. <laughs>